Uh, what Thank you, Bettina. Um... Yeah, I was still muted. So I think it's my role to turn over, uh, take over from you. Thank you very much for the introduction and the information on housekeeping. A warm welcome on my behalf and on behalf of Global Nature Fund, being the host together with the Lake Constance Foundation of this event today. It's a great pleasure to welcoming you to this event on microplastics and the impacts of microplastics to lake, lakes. Um, my name is Udo Gattenlöhner. I'm the director of Global Nature Fund, a foundation that is based in Germany. And together with the Lake Constance Foundation and Lega Ambiente from Italy, we are working on this topic of microplastic pollution to lakes and the impacts, endocrine impacts and health related impacts to human beings, but also to other, um, to animals, for instance, um, in, in water ecosystems. I will share my screen and give you a very brief overview on this project as well as on the agenda of this event today. And we have four speakers, which I will introduce to you in a minute. And we're very happy and grateful that those experts have agreed and volunteered to join our event today. I hope that your motivation to join this event is very similar uh, to our motivation to organize it. First and foremost, of course, we want to share relevant information on this aspect of microplastic pollution in lakes, um, of course, on what can be done to deal with that and on negative effects uh, to human beings and to animals and plants. On the other hand, we also want to stimulate kind of networking. So we encourage you um, to ask questions. You can do that during the presentations by typing questions into the chat. And Dimitri Vedel, the colleague from the Lake Constance Foundation, will collect and cluster those questions. And he will forward them to the speakers in the last section of this conference or this meeting today. You're also invited to bilaterally get in touch with the speakers and their organizations, institutions, or us, and we're happy to connect you and provide contacts uh, to establish direct connections. As I said, networking is always a very important side effect of such events. And probably you might have the same impression that I some, that sometimes have. It's um, Sometimes it feels quite uh, encouraging and motivating, motivating to feel that you're not alone working on specific topics. So uh, that's a little bit of a psychological event. So without too much further ado, I will introduce you to this Blue Lakes project supported by the European Commission in the framework of uh, the LIFE program. I assume that most of you are familiar with that program. It's the largest grant scheme of the European Commission for Environmental Activities. We have been able to also secure some co-funding from Plastics Europe, from the postcode lottery, as well as from the friends of the Lake Constance Research Institute. And uh, we're also, of course, very grateful for that financial support. So next slide. Presumably you know what microplastics or nanoplastics is, very small particles that you can find in ecosystems, in nature, primary or secondary microplastic. That means microplastic that uh, either derives from larger particles um, that are um, gradually uh, going into smaller particles or that even from the very beginning are occur as small particles, uh, various polymers that form these microplastic uh, substances. And of course, plastics is a general issue. It's, it's a problem that we have to tackle. Macroplastics, larger plastic particles that can be found all over the world, as well as this microplastic, which is the topic of our event today. 
And um, looking at the sources of microplastic, to name just a few or the most relevant ones, you might know that tires and abrasion from tires, but also from road marking, for instance, is one of the most important source or the most important source of microplastic contamination. But there are some other ones that in terms of volume are less relevant, but in terms of effect must be considered as well, uh, like uh, textile or cosmetics and agriculture, for instance, that is a relevant one that is missing in that list. Uh, as already mentioned, uh, invited by our Italian colleagues from Legambiente, uh, almost two years ago, we have started an EU life project uh, with the title Blue Lakes, uh, with a focus on five lakes, five water ecosystems in Italy and in Germany. And the objectives in a nutshell of that project are, um, I have highlighted the five most important ones are to develop a lake paper um, for municipalities. The Lake Constance Foundation is working on that at the time being. Uh, the focus of uh, some of the universities that are part of the consortium in Italy is very much on the development of a standard monitoring protocol um, for the analysis of microplastic in water samples uh, to be able, for instance, to compare and properly assess uh, those um, impacts that you have from microplastic. The third one is to develop a technical protocol um, with a focus then on its end of pipe, but at the time being there is microplastic already in the environment, how to extract microplastic in sewage treatment facilities and sewage treatment plants using a fourth or a fifth stage, uh, for instance, with activated carbon. And then we have kind of an outreach policy and education aspect in this project as well. I don't go into detail, but of course, kind of a precautionary principle and pollute the pace uh, aspect is that we want to involve the industry uh, from the very beginning and underline the responsibility of the industry, also from a financial point of view, and at the same time trying to improve already existing, quite appropriate legal frameworks that we do have within the European Union. So now, very briefly uh, on our event today, as you can see, we have structured uh, our event in two parts in, in two sessions, the first one, and we will have a break in between. We will have two presentations on um, tire abrasion, which is, as I said, one of the most important source uh, of microplastic uh, on into lakes and, and water ecosystems, also rivers and groundwater, of course. Um, and um, then also impacts on um, on, micro, on eco, what ecosystems in general. And then we have a, after the break, we'll have a second session um, with a focus rather on the impact of the fish fauna. And um, then starting a general discussion and exchange session, we will have a little bit an outlook on regulatory frameworks and legal frameworks um, from uh, Laura Gessner from the Environmental Action Germany. So without, I will introduce the speakers to you prior to every presentation. Um, so without too much further ado, we will get started. And our first presenter, and once again, uh, I would like to express my gratitude that you have agreed to our invitation and share your profound knowledge and experiences with us is Daniel Benghaus. And uh, Daniel is working at the Technical University of Berlin and working on a PhD with a specific focus uh, on the assessment of microplastic in urban water management um, schemes or systems. And we're very curious to hear more uh, from your work and your experiences, uh, Daniel. This is your floor, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I will start sharing my presentation. Is it ready for you now? It's visible, yes. All right. So again, thank you very much. 
Um, today, I uh, probably use all the 20 minutes to uh, briefly sum up uh, most of our actual work and some uh, previous work. Um, today, I want to introduce to you some solution approaches to reduce the transport of tire and roadway particles and other microplastics and other pollutants uh, from road run runoff into the aquatic environment. Um, as already mentioned, I'm um, uh, working at the Chair of Urban Water, Man Water Management uh, under Professor Beinbruch. I'm working there since 2013 and I worked on up to now on a few projects uh, and the actual project where we are designing a new innovative uh, filter and filter concept, uh, which is funded by the Audi Environmental Foundation. Um, we are just in the middle of our project and we, we were quite success successful up to now and we are really looking forward to the upcoming results. And of course, uh, I'm not working alone. I'm working in a quite big team, as I, I think, um, in also in the field, not only road runoff, also focusing on wastewater treatment plants, also focusing on washing machines and improving uh, different solutions. Um, here, just a, an overview for you probably to get an idea what these discussions about tire wear in Germany uh, means and what it is related to. So all in all, we have an estimation about 100,000 tons of tire material uh, per year in Germany. For Europe, the estimation uh, is up to 500,000 tons. We already heard it in uh, the introduction. Uh, that probably tire wear is one of the main impact uh, or the main source of microplastics in the environment. Uh, but for us now, it was of course very important to, to focus on where is the main release to the aquatic environment. Um, and that is quite obviously from the urban areas. So uh, almost one third of the, these 1000 tons in Germany um, are generated in urban areas, and most of these materials are ending up in the nearby rivers and lakes. So just to give you an idea how these systems work, on the one hand, we have separate systems where road runoff is separately um, led to directly normally to the surface waters, with generally without any treatment. And then we have the commercial and household wastewater, which is directly um, transported to a wastewater treatment plant, uh, which in general does a great job and uh, cleans most of the pollutants uh, over the whole treatment process. Then we have combined, combined systems where rainwater and wastewater ends up in one uh, sewer system, and that may lead to combined sewage water overflows. Because you can imagine from time to time, if when we have very heavy rains, these, um, these combined uh, sewer system uh, can't deal with this big load of water. And then we have this combined sewage, sewage water overflows, which means wastewater combined with road runoff is directly led into the surface waters. So what does that mean for tire wear? In general, Ben Spalt estimated that um, from transportation infrastructure in urban areas, we have up to 30,000 tons per year and about 50% from the separate system end up directly in the surface water, 11% end up via combined huge discharge and only 2% uh, may end up from the, at the effluent of a wastewater treatment plant process, which all in all uh, makes a summed up assumption of 16, 17,000 uh, tons tire material per year. Um, so for us in the previous project, Rau, 
it was at first a big challenge to track these particles, to find them in the environment. Uh, we, we spent quite a lot of effort to sample uh, road runoff, to sample road dust, to also um, track all the, the important site informations, like for example, traffic in, in intensity. Uh, and finally, we figured out that probably to define the uh, potential of tire wear material or of microplastic release into the aquatic environment by sewer system is to sample the road dust because it's that is quite comfortable. The road dust is quite comfortable to sample uh, and it has a high potential to be flooded by different rain intensities. What we could figure out in the Rao project was that we can now define different hotspots. And hotspots means more or less tire wear in a, at a certain point uh, in inner city areas. And here you, here you just get an idea that a curve has up to seven times more tire, uh, tire wear um, than a straight or uh, a slope road. And the traffic light with a, uh, at, at a crossing has up to three times more tire wear. And that is important for us because if we want to address measures like filters in gully pots or also professional street cleanings, you can imagine you can't clean all the city and you can't implement these filters in every gully pot. It would be far too much uh, uh, effort. Um, so what kind of opportunities does the urban filter projects offer us now? So on the one hand, we develop a modular, modular filter solution for these hotspots I described. Then we uh, designed an intelligent network. I'm gonna explain that a bit later. And of course, we also want to enlighten um, the citizens. Um, the intelligent network uh, it came up to our mind that it is not, not just only the hardware where we have to focus on or where we should focus on. We also have to define diffuse and local um, hotspots for microplastics from different sources like tire wear, but also from construction site, traffic accidents, um, and from local spots like, we call them boredom hotspots, for example, example, bus stops where people wait, throw away their cigarette dumps or uh, coffee to go uh, cup holders, service yard sports fields, and of course, things like event locations where we could implement filter solutions for just a quite short time. Just to give you here an idea of what it means for, for a street, these intelligent network, these data, which we could, should keep in mind, it is, of course, it, did an accident happen, uh, or if an accident happens, Please make sure that you clean the area around the accident properly, not only having oil pollution in mind, but also these plastic pollutions. Um, for these other locations like bore hotspots, I already mentioned these cigarette dumps, but also for construction areas, it seems to be quite interesting, for example, for the styropore particles, which often are led into the environment uh, during construction period. So now we, we have the idea of these hotspots in, in, in different urban areas. And we come up now with, with a modular perspective and uh, we define three stages. So the street, the gully pot and the drain um, stage and the first stage the street stage has mainly uh, in focus to keep the particles, the pollutants on the road and not just and, and avoid them entering the gully at all. So that the professional street cleaning, for example, can, can clean them before a rain event. And inside the gully, there we have different technical uh, um, filter solution. For example, uh, we are very successful now with, with a combination of a funnel and a mesh skirt, I'm gonna show you later. And in a drain, we uh, figured out that the magnets can help us quite a lot. So here you may just get a brief idea about our test stand at uh, Technical University 
of whirling. Here we can simulate different rank intensities and we can add different pollutants. Um, and in this um, visual gully pot, uh, we can directly see the interaction between the filter module and the test substance. Which kind of test substance we have on the the, the, the most important test substance we need is real road dust. We've, we are fractionizing the road dust and afterwards we add, add it and then we get the percentage of retention from the filter module. But also we are working with um, tire powder. We are working with cigarette dumps as, as seen here on the picture and special granulates used in the industry and this uh, plastic cup holders. Here for our most important uh, um, testing material, the road dust, uh, I of course show you a successful test, um, but honestly, we are really quite happy that with the road dust, our system mesh skirt and funnel works very well. So for any um, rain intensity, we have a very good retention rate, even for the very small particles, smaller than 63 microns, we can retain uh, an average up to 66%. And here, just to give you a brief idea about what we figured out with the magnet, we figured out that especially these fine matter, 63 micron and, and, and smaller, interact with a special magnet. It works in dry material and it also works in, in uh, uh, water surrounding. So after um, designing the filters at the special test stand, we are now uh, um, uh, we now put some in our in situ uh, test area test field uh, in Berlin Clearly. Um, here we have different sampling technologies like of course special water samplers, radar sensors, data loggers, and uh, inspection endostro endoscope to weekly check if our filter is still uh, in proper conditions. So uh, the filter we have now installed is our module optimized leaf basket, uh, which we designed together with ours and uh, GKD. And uh, just to give you here an idea, it's not clean work. It's, it's quite dirty work. It's uh, these go goalie, um, Manholes have to be prepared first, then we implement our filter. And now we are checking it regularly, how much uh, um, material we could keep over 12 months. So the goal is to keep the filter for 12 months and then uh, maintain it. Uh, we are also planning or proceeding for other in situ locations. Uh, this week, we're gonna check the ADAC Fahrsicherheitszentrum Berlin Brandenburg. It's a test field for or a test drive uh, for a special car handling handling field, um, which offers us an opportunity to address especially tire wear. But we are also uh, in discussion with special industry uh, fields where big uh, trucks are, are working in stress situations where we have special um, industry transport uh, uh, facilities where big tires are used uh, and where probably also a lot of tire wear is emitted. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, check these facilities and then we'll decide which filter combination might be the best. Uh, and the last point is the public regulation point. Um, we have defined about 16 stops for an exhibition from north to, to south of Germany. And of course, we are open for, for other exhibition uh, possibilities and also uh, across uh, or over Germany, over Europe, probably. Uh, our first event was the Green Tech Festival in uh, 2021, uh, where we could present very successful our ideas, our concept. Here you see the exhibit with the diff three different uh, stages and you can turn them and then you will see the three uh, different modules per stage. 
And we are lucky that we are able to present it this year again in June uh, 22 at now Berlin Tegel, because Berlin Tegel is retired and it's now open for such events. Uh, we also could present it at the European SDG Summit in two, uh, 2021, uh, which of course helps us to, um, to offer these solutions for a wide uh, audience. And of course, it's also important for us to present it for uh, in, in very technical surroundings, like for example, the, IFA, the upcoming IFAD in May in Munich. So you're more than welcome to visit us there. It should be quite close for, for, for some of you maybe. And what we also do, we are working in practical interaction with uh, the society uh, at events like, for example, meet the scientists, um, together with the um, Audi initiative, initiative uh, plogging, which means collect uh, litter while jogging um, with especially uh, red um, litter bags. And we made the experience that it really sen sensibilized uh, yeah, people around us. Some supported us, some were quite curious, but especially the kids and the young people were really supporting us, helping us. And they were aware that, especially on this picture you see here, cigarette dumps are or seem also to be a very big problem, uh, which by the way is also addressed in our filter concept. So finally, uh, don't hesitate to check our homepage urbanfilter.org there you also have again these uh, hot spots defined and you can on your own decide which filter might be the best for each hotspot. Uh, and now I want to thank you for your attention and I'm of course open for, for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for that uh, fascinating overview on the details uh, of impacts of tire abrasion. Uh, to the environment and to uh, water and sewage in an urban context. So thank you also for respecting the time frame. So we have really time left for some immediate questions. So I would like to ask you to raise your virtual hand if you want to point out a question or still I can remind you to that you can type it in the chat and my colleague Dimitri will check that regularly and forward the question. So are there any immediate questions? I would have many, Asta, but of course, uh, I would like to give you the floor first. Not the case. Um, I have one burning uh, question, Daniel, to you. Um, if I understood you correctly, uh, then if you kind of implement or install a proper, I would call it a, a gutter gully filter system, on the hotspots, and if I understood you correctly, the hotspots in an urban context would be primarily the traffic lights and the curves. So if you install such a filter in the gully that are properly connected, of course, to a certain gutter connection system, then you can extract a larger or a significant portion of the microplastic from tire abrasion. So my question now is, um, can you also estimate the costs of such a system? And I know it's complicated, but maybe you can give an educated guess uh, can you give a rough estimation what, to what extent such a system in an urban context in an industrialized countries, country would increase the costs per tire? I know it's different from a car to a truck to a two-wheeler, but and I'm, I'm not sure whether you thought about that. We haven't been speaking about that prior to this event, but uh, of course that would be quite interesting to know to what extent such a system would increase the cost of tires. Thank you for the question. Finally, it's a very interesting question and it might be uh, interesting also to, to play with these uh, costs. Uh, by now, of course, I don't have an estimation how much uh, all the modules would cost because we are developing, still developing uh, many of them. 
That is one, one point. The other point is that I am really lucky now to be funded by a foundation uh, which doesn't have an in, a commercial interest to, to produce filters which they want to sell afterwards. So from the scientific point of view, now I, I, I have the first time the chance to, uh, to, to test from the beginning. And with this intelligent network, um, I can optimize continuously the performance of the filter. Um, so in general, the filters are designed most robust and not that expensive. That is, a, that is an answer I, I can give you. Um, but if a company would commercialize it, of course, it depends on how much they produce, how much they can sell. And finally, the costs are not only related to the investment costs, but mainly to the maintenance costs. And um, there, the intelligent network is a very, very important part because if it works well, so if just one example, if we, we have the weather forecast in mind and we can optimize it with a professional street cleaning and the professional street cleaning is cleaning these certain hotspots after a certain dry period, but one day before a rain event, then all this pollutants, also tire wear, won't be um, flushed into our gully where our filter is installed. So if this intelligent network works very well, of course, the filter probably can, can stay there for two years or three years. And that also depends on the spot and the surrounding conditions around our filter. And the maintenance costs from my point of view are the main costs. The investment costs for a filter might not be that dramatic. And if we have in mind the costs for a tire, uh, well, I didn't make this assumption up to now, but I think it's also very, a very early, early step to think about these, uh, these things. And what we also always have to take in account is that if we clean road runoff, we are generally not only focusing on tire wear. We are also focusing on all the other pollutants and we are generally not cleaning road runoff at all. So it is anyway a big, well, a big task and a big challenge. So tire wear is only a part in, in normally if I have a presentation uh, in person, I could show you now again, these material after sweeping. I had one slide where you could see the different fractions. And I guess that the percentage of tire wear in these fractions is quite low. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is enough time and room for one or two more questions with a, a quick answer. So I see Dimitri, you raise your hand. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Udo, just for a better understanding, Daniel. Um, can you just, you, you already gave some um, parts of um, in, your, in of my question answers in your in your answer recently, um, just to give us an idea of how long um, these tire abrasions are fixed on the roads and um, regarding the climate change and the different regions in the world. Can you estimate um, how this will affect uh, the sewage waters in, in, in the near future with climate change? Are we looking forward to have more or um, in different intensities of these microplastics in the, in the sewage waters? Uh, thank you very much for this question. It's a very good question. Um, I have one slide where I addressed the spots where we also implementing other gully filters from uh, Ariasea I mentioned and the other one. There in the back, you have the climate change map from, from Germany. So we are aware of this topic. And well, um, I, I not completely have, I don't have a completely fixed answer to this. But for sure, I guess that if we have longer dry periods, the accumulation also of particles like tire wear will get uh, well, lo longer dry periods probably will accumulate more a higher load of also 
tire pollutants on the road, which will be flooded, for example, uh, by rain events. But having this in mind, for example, in, in certain areas in Germany, there, this again, this intelligent networks, this road cleaning before this rain event. If we have four weeks dry weather, then on the one hand, we have a high accumulation of pollutants. And on the other hand, we have a anyway stressed water body with less, uh, without less oxygen. So if we get then a high load of pollutants from the road, it will harm the water body far more than after, I don't know, if we had, if we have cold weather, if we have lots of wind, and if we have many rain events one by one. So yes, we have, we have it in mind um, and we try to address it. We try to be ready for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Last question, um, Bettina. I received another question in the chat. Um, how much microplastics related to the rest has been collected since installation of the urban filter? Uh, I can't answer this question because we have just installed uh, the first filter in, in March. Uh, and well, we're gonna uh, check the filter probably in, now in summer next time, and then again in uh, October. And then we can say how much microplastics, how much uh, pollutants we separated already. But from our test stands, as I, I showed before, uh, for road dust, we can separate up to 99% of uh, all solids where microplastics are apart from. And of course, we also make the test and uh, uh, tests with certain microplastics, also with tire powder. And for tire powder, we don't have such good retention rates which could lead to, to, to the thinking that probably we have to improve the filter. But at this point, we always have to be aware that it is not possible to get real tire and road wear particles. So um, an accumulation of tire material and road uh, material for test stand uh, tests. So there we have to work in situ. And that this answer probably I can give you at the end of the year. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for that excellent overview. Um, you have been mentioning the fair trade IFAT in Munich. Uh, we will we'll be visiting and attending that one as well. So I hope that we will have an opportunity to meet in real life and in person on that occasion. Uh, thank you very much again. So with that, I would like to introduce you to the next uh, speaker in the next presentation with a focus on microplastics in aquatic ecosystems. And we're happy to have uh, Hannes Imhof with us. Hannes is a scientist working at the University of Bayreuth. And the university is very famous for its collaborative research center with a focus on microplastic. But Hannes has also some previous and a lot of profound experiences on research with the German Ocean Foundation and some other institutes and universities. So we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Um, Anis, this is your floor. Yes, thank you very much. I just start my slides and the video and the screen sharing. So I think you see my, my screen with a nice ducks here. Yes. Um, I would like to say hello. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm here for Professor Laforge. He's the speaker of the CRC Microplastic, and I'm currently working in the coordination office of the CRC and also in the chair of animal ecology. And the first question is why do we as an animal ecologist are interested in microplastic research? So organisms are in their environment, like the small fish here in a, in a lake, and they have to eat. They are predated by larger fish. They have parasites, they can get ill. There are a lot of abiotic factors, which are in, in the lake, it can be warmer or more sun or so ever. And there are micropollutants since we humans are on this earth. And this is the micropollutant. I now work since my PhD uh, 12 years ago. So these are small, tiny microplastic particles. And Microplastic is, as you know, a really hot topic in the news. There's not even one week with, without a 
new headline, the last one was microplastic in lungs of humans. So how could it be that a problem solver like the toothbrush here on the left side turned into a real problem in the environment? And I would like to go with you through the question, is microplastic dangerous? And uh, I have to admit it's more microplastic thumb theater than a proper, no, proper is wrong, uh, than a scientific presentation. I would like to give a real big overview about microplastic water ecosystems and what, is, what does we have from this? So thank you very much, Dania, you are already introduced what is microplastic. So I cut up my slides a little bit, but the problem is there is somehow plastic which gets into the environment. And one reason is that a large portion of the plastic generated in the EU, EU, EU and also worldwide is packaging uh, materials. They are very lightweight and they can go everywhere. So they get into the environment, for example, and photo UV radiation, sunlight, and mechanical action can lead to the the fragmentation of microplastic. And I think most of you know those slides. There are many, many things in the environment. We are able to estimate how long they um, will persist in the environment. And I will show you some results of the CRC. I always mark them with a small SFB button here on the right side. And colleagues from us recently really showed what is going on when polystyrene is in the environment and when they are fragmenting with the photo oxidation and the degradation of microplastic particles. And really astonishing is that if you have a particle with 160 micrometer, it took 1.6 years. And after that, we have 500 particles in the size of 20 micrometer. So really there is a strong degradation going on. It doesn't take 500 years until, until something is mineralized. This process really goes with fragmentation and we produce more and more very tiny microplastic particles. And the process doesn't stop at the 20 micrometer stage. They are further fragmented to, let's call it for this moment, nanoplastic. The same is true for polyethylene. A recent study published some weeks ago, um, this, uh, almost a similar thing happens with polyethylene. If polyethylene gets in the environment, it's get abrasion, surface cracking, and after that, the formation of nanoparticles and the aggregation with environmental particles. So clearly there's a production of nanoparticles. But for now, let's talk about microplastic with past par particles made of plastic materials smaller than five millimeter. Back to the question, is microplastic dangerous? Plastic, what is plastic? Plastic is a material produced of monomers. There are polymerization reactions going on and we have the plastic material, but it's not the one plastic material. There are multitude of plastic materials because we have a very, very diverse group of products which are made of plastic. And it's cool, it's a cool thing. Um, so we need a lot of materials to make polymers like they are. We need starters, accelerators, we need some other additives like antioxidants, plasticizers, antistatic, surface enhancement, metals, taste, color pigments, filler, stabilizer, biocides. They are partially more than 20% in a product are additives. There are many, many substances. Some of them are related uh, with cancer organic effects or endocrine disrupting effects, but it's a really real big number of substances. Though so we have potentially harmful substances made by the manufacturers like additives or monomers from incomplete polymerization, but we also have environmental pollutants. For example, PCB and beach plastic particles, if they are collected and checked, there are on some of them is PC, uh, PCB on top. The same is true for DDT. There are also some particles with DDT. So these could be potential problems. The second question is, to answer is microplastic dangerous? How much microplastic is in the environment, like lakes and rivers? I make a shortcut. We have microplastic everywhere. Literally, we can can go, can't go anywhere and don't find microplastic. I give you one example from the North American Great Lakes, one example from a remote lake in the Mongolia, and I will focus a little bit more on a study we did some years ago. The publication will come out in the next weeks, but it's a more or less older study right now. Um, we collected 51 um, surface water samples in German, southwestern German rivers. 
with the Manta trawl, and we found amounts of three to 214 particles per cubic meter. If you know how many cubic meter, no, how many liter are a cubic meter, this is not a big number. But what is very astonishing, microplastic was everywhere. It was in the Alpine region, in highly populated area, and in industrialized area. If you have this, have a look at that, it's more or less everywhere. From source to lowland areas, and we have a closer look to some sample spots, and um, we found no clear pattern. It's not that it's increasing from Basel to the estuary of the Rhine, or if you are sampling in distances of 522 or 151 hours and 151 41 days, it's a kind of a random thing. More plastic, lower amount of plastic, but plastic is in our rivers, and it's just in the upper surface layer. And I will talk a little bit more about size classes, which can find at some places. So it's just an, a first look in, inside. Coming back to it's found everywhere. This is a study we did in a small, in, small and remote area in the Maldives. It was a non-inhabited island. There were no persons living on it. We were sampling the shoreline every day. And every day, we found new plastic particles. And nobody lives on this island. So it could not be from this island. We really have a global problem. And the microplastic research did their way from the sink, let's see the sea, and we found plastic in the sea. Then we made it our way up in the rivers, we found plastic in the rivers. Now we can make one step further. How does the plastic comes into the rivers? They are coming with terrestrial runoff from land and also on land agricultural uh, farmland, there's a high abundance of microplastic particles. How does it come to the, mic to the, land to the landscape? For example, one example, just one. Um, you think that in the brown baskets where you put the organic waste inside, there's just organic, uh, organic waste. That's the idea. The reality sadly is that people drop everything they don't need and they won't like to, or in the, uh, in the last years, this would be maybe things you put in the forest. Now it's the way it's easier to put it into the brown basket and put it in front of your door. So in many, many of these, the, in the bio-waste digestion plants, they were found 900 particles per kilo, kilogram of dry weight. So there's a high abundance of plastic waste, for example, in the brown bins you put out of your door. So this is just one basket. There was one review which are calculating all these numbers and they figured out that the microplastic abundance in water is just nothing compared to the microplastic and the microplastic which is emitted into the terrestrial environment. And having this in mind, we can also think a little bit further. Microplastic is very light and it's very stable. And this is just one review I could put five more and many, many studies. Microplastic is on the alpine glaciers, on the glaciers in the Arctic. You can find it in the, in the sea ice, you can find it in the fresh snow. Really, literally, literally, we have the problem. We have microplastic almost everywhere. But this doesn't tell us something about is microplastic dangerous? The important question now is, are organisms exposed to microplastic? And for sure, you all know the, the images. Depending on the size of the organism, the size of the particles, uh, organisms are exposed and they really suffer from the contact with plastic materials. They can entangle, uh, turtles eat plastic um, bags, birds pick up um, colorful pieces, and also the water fleas. We, for example, in lab work, they also ingest the tiny gear red marked plastic particles. Um, you could think, well, in a lake, there is a plastic coming up from the top, somehow gets into the lake. Well, it will sink down to the bottom. It's there, it's dumped, it's away. But for example, Lake Constance in summer, it's stratified. You have warm layer up and a cold layer down. And there really is a, a layer of, um, of the, the Sprungschicht, the, the Metalimnion in the middle. And this meta, uh, meta Limnion, I'm sorry, for, I missed the English word, um, is really trapping particles and they 
are stopping in the warm layer above and will always the entire summer accumulate all microplastic which come up from, from the upper surface. This is a recent study from colleagues from our CLC. And there's also a follow-up study, which very interesting insights into how microplastic is trapped or is sinking um, from the top to the bottom. And we are very curious. They also put out a mesocosm in the, in the lake in Franken. And I'm very curious what they will found in the next years. Um, another interesting thing is there's a river and microplastic is transported with the, with the water. But it's not only getting with the water, it also sticks into the ground. It gets into the hyporeic interstitia. It's the pore area, which is in the, in the, in the, the water sediment um, boundary layer. It does not only get into it, it also is transported into it. And here you see in this nice GIF how these particles get into the sediment and get further transported into the sediment. And this also has very interesting implications for um, our future. Are, are we humans exposed to microplastic? For sure, we ingest it with our food and the recent studies just tell it, it's also microplastic was found in blood and also in our lungs, in the lung tissue. But this always also does not tell us, is microplastic dangerous? We need two, two more questions. Are microplastic, to answer it, are microplastic particles itself harmful? And are the microplastic concentrations relevant for us? Is there enough microplastic out in the environment to harm us? And this are, these are the two last questions I would like to discuss. What is known and unknown about the effects of microplastic? This is a review study and they found ecosystem, population, organisms, a lot of effects which were tested and had a negative effect from particle to the, to the organisms or the, um, the structures. But there are also many, many studies which showed, I'm sorry, he is missing no effect. Um, there were many no effect studies out in the, in the scientific literature. And this is a very strange image right now. And that's the reason why on many questions you all would like to ask, we have from the scientific point of view, sometimes you have to say, actually, it could be a problem, but we don't know in the moment. And maybe this could be one reason why we are not able to give a clear answer. These are two microplastic particles you can buy to make studies. It's a polystyrene bead. And on the left side and on the right side is a polystyrene bead, and the same size, different brands. And many studies I, was sh I showed you here were working with such beads in the smaller size classes. The problem is they look same, they are called same, but they are not the same. Um, these are experiments with cells and the cells ingested on this side, these particles and on this side not. And one of the major difference between the particles were uh, certain um, surface property, which was different. And so one reason, and we, the colleagues here did the study with a lot of beads, which, you, which is able to buy and which are the main um, base on, on many, many scientific experiments right now. Um, they are not really very, very different. And this could be one, one side on the, of the answer. Another thing is that microplastic is in the environment. It's aged, it's weathered, and there's also biofouling going on. There's biofilm, which is built up on the particles itself. And here you see the sa a similar experiment. You have cells and you have particles. And the particles with, we call it for now, eco-corona, biofilm, which is grown over the particles, lead that there are more particles are ingested by cells than if there is no eco-corona on the particles. And also this makes this question really, really hard to answer because we have polymers, we have particles, different polymers, different sizes, different shapes. We have different chemical and physical properties. We have this thing, it's called aging in the environment. The particles got older, they are, get brittle and they are fragment. And we have environmental things going on with the particles in the environment. And this makes it very, very complex to ans answer the easy question, is microplastic dangerous? 
The last question I announced was, are the microplastic concentrations relevant? And actually, I can't tell you right now. The problem is, most studies which have negative effects or clear negative effects have done work with a microplastic around one micrometer, or let's say 10 micrometer. If you have microplastic sampling like here with a manta tor on the left side or sediment samples on the right side, we end up with samples which look like that. And it's not easy to detect tiny amounts of microplastic in there. There's a Really, really hard. Um, Sebastian will tell us about this, for example, a little bit later. You have an environmental sample. You need a lot of purification methods to get only potential plastic particles. And then you need very sophisticated and um, spectrometric methods to get identification of these particles. And I will show you a filter, which could it look like that and after such a purification process. And there are two good methods. There are also more methods for sure, but these are two good ones. Um, FTIR, it's a Fourier transformation infrared spectroscopy or it's this Raman laser microspectroscopy and they work until 50 micrometer or 20 micrometer. But for the exposure size where we have really experiments with negative effects, we have no routine analytics. We have no high throughput method. I actually right now, we cannot really tell you how many particles are there. We can estimate it. This is one study I did in 2016, and we were sampling five millimeter to the slower to the lower size classes. And as you see here, the number of particles are increasing in the lower size classes. And we really think that we're currently just sampling the tip of the iceberg. It's there's a lot of microplastic maybe in the environment, but you just can't detect it. And this is why we have currently more questions than answers. And the results are an urgent need for research right now. We have clearly uh, a, a gap of knowledge to answer the question, is microplastic dangerous? What are the solutions? Is refusal a solution to tackle the current microplastic issues? Um, and this includes daily life. Uh, microplastic or plastic is a really important working material. This includes daily life products, medical applications, and modern life science techniques. Also, we have to here we have climate have to do climate protection. Also, here plastic is really important. So we think in the CRC that we have to check um, the biological effects, the, the degradation and the migration be health, uh, behavior in the environment, the transport behavior, and the degradation. And we have in the CRC the great opportunity to work with geoscientists, polymer scientists, and biologists to tackle this interdisciplinary problem and to derive important environmental properties and determine the environmental risk of microplastic and to develop new and innovative solutions to tackle the, the problem of microplastic. And with that, I would like to thank you to all the scientists which are working in the CRC and help to gather all this information. And I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Hannes. Uh, very comprehensive and complex overview on a very complex and complicated topic, of course. Uh, we have enough time uh, to take a number of questions directly related to what Hannes has been referring to and talking about. So please raise your hands if you have questions and uh, Dimitri, if there is anything in the chat. Or yeah, there, exactly. There's one question uh, in the chat. Um, it's a quite a long question. So I would invite to read all, uh, all of you to read it, uh, or maybe the question can be addressed directly to Hannes. Sure, just, um, is it in the chat? I'm yeah, sorry. it's in the chat. Ah, okay. Maybe you can summarize it, Dimitri. Yeah, um, it, it's just appeared just a but, minute. Okay, the, the, the beads I was talking about are generated microplastic beads, which are produced more for scientific purposes. It's a very, it was not the aim of the industry to make testing materials. Um, there's a lot of um, issues where you need particles which have a defined size and which have a defined structure. Um, calibration of microscopes or calibration of dust um, sensors, for example, use such, such polymer beads. So there is 
in this case, for on my side, no need to check for the industry if those are harmful because they have a really a, a, a strict usage. Uh, in the case, the biological scientists are working with this um, and doing really experiments to tackle the question if uh, this polymer the particles are made of is harmful for answering a larger question if polystyrene for example itself is toxic um, the it would be nice to have more information of the industry about the properties like surface tension surface modulations polymer content additives whatever but um, sometimes the industry itself doesn't know it really good because um, it's there is sometimes the idea that you could make a part a plastic material without any chemics and this is not possible you need at least a certain amount of additives to just produce it to melt something to mold it to bring it into the the machines so a certain amount of additives will always be necessary so maybe i hope this was part of the answer to the question <laughs> yeah thank you very much uh, Hannes. Uh, of course it's complex uh, and it's obvious that it's uh, not so easy to define accurately with scientific evidence uh, how dangerous microplastics might be. To my understanding, it's without doubt that there is a certain danger, danger in, in terms of uh, applying a kind of precautionary principle. Uh, I think it would be certainly wise to consider, and this is my question now, uh, that there certainly will be, if you look at aggregation and interaction, um, a kind of a multiplication of effects of pharmaceutical products and pesticides and microplastic in terms of their endocrine and carcinogenic uh, effect on, on organisms in general. Or, Absolutely. I hope that nobody understands that I sell we have no microplastic evidence, no evidence for scientific um, results. Uh, please don't misunderstand it. It's not that we have now can say, hey, it's nothing to do. It's just what we, we think that um, what is often a measure, just refuse plastic itself, uh, live without plastic. From our side, could be one part because we're just reducing the amount of plastic products we use, okay. But I think there are more wise solutions from the industry necessary to improve the, the plastic materials. And that's something what we are doing right now. And um, for example, one problem is that we have, let's talk about this large issue of biodegradability, um, which makes, which is not the best, solution way maybe we, we have to define what what could be our solution to make it to make it very, really strong pictures to make it black and white one solution could be to, to make it hard and heavy and dump it and store it in the sediment could be could be it's not my preferred option but could be the black option maybe like like the uh, radioactive waste could be and there is maybe another way like um we are producing particles and we are making a polymer which is biodegradable, for example. And this is possible um, to make a proper biodegradable polymer. Currently, they are not produced because the properties of those are not as good as the ones of the conventional ones, and they make problems right now. But in the CRC, our polymer chemistry colleagues um, develop, and it's not developed to the end, a very good method to make a biodegrade, a real biodegradable polymer. It's mineralizable to a CO2. And uh, the barrier properties, for example, are almost as good as the gold standard of in a, in a conventional, it's PV, PVDC. Um, it's not developed to the end, but also this could be an option. I, I cannot tell you right now, where is the real option uh, the real solution to, to tackle the problem, but between dumping and making biodegradability improve, there, there, uh, there's a plenty of, of possibilities. Thank you very much. Any further questions? There is enough time to take one or two more. Not immediately the case. Yeah, quite interesting to see that you have also done, if I understood you correctly, some investigation on Hofskoll, 
in Mongolia, actually a lake that is member in our Living Lakes Network and I had uh, the pleasure of being there once. And uh, of course, it's a little bit frightening to see that such remote water ecosystems are also contaminated already uh, with microplastics. And what I found uh, also quite um, interesting in your presentation is the, the high contamination of these particles in soil in comparison to, to water ecosystems. I wasn't necessarily aware of that. You can imagine that there is a certain accumulation effect in agriculture, for instance, um, in, in view on, on kind of uh, modus operandi in, in the past, how the sludge has been uh, used then in agriculture. So I can imagine that this might ha also have an effect on accumulation in, um, in terrestrial ecosystems. Um, I'm not sure whether you see a connection there. Okay. Udo, sorry to interrupt you. There is just one uh, question that appeared in, in the chat and <clears throat> was addressing also the, the question about um, the form of the microplastic that in all of the research already done, um, we, th there was an, an even um, product, an even particle, but most of these um, particles found in the open waters are not round and even. So maybe Hannes, you can just to say something to, to this um, question or to this remark? Um, the particles in the environment are not, not round and even. The problem is, and I, now I can't, again come with a scientific problem, I'm not telling that we have to stop doing something against microplastic. This is a big misunderstanding. So the, we have to do something against it for sure because it's accumulating and we have, it's, it's a global problem. But the question, is it dangerous? I'm not sure right now, because for example, I said, it's a very complex topic. Um, currently a lot of scientific uh, literature or reports are done with round beads. Um, therefore for round beads, some answers are there. For sure in the environment, there are more fragments and more fibers, but from, a bead pers from an anim animal perspective, I cannot, go from a, from a round one with nice edges, which is smooth to a, something which is sharp and, 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 and long, uh, long fins, for example. This is a difference. And what we are doing currently is uh, what many, many researchers are doing right now to improve the, the database we have, because maybe there's one effect which is uh, from, from the structural side, it's more, more mechanical problem. And there's an, another, there are other effects like indirect effects from chemicals, which are transported with the particles or monomers or something like that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, looking at Dimitri and Bettina, looking at them virtually through my camera, uh, I presume that there are no further questions, then I would suggest that we start with our little break. Uh, so we will take a 20 minutes break. So I would like to kind of ask you, to reconvene at 3.30 our time, Central European time, that's in 20 minutes time. Please stay online, stay with us, just um, stay muted. And you can, if you like, of course, uh, switch off your camera, but not leave the session. Uh, I think that would be easier. So we will meet again, reconvene in 20 minutes time, and then, um, we will have two more presentations on the effects um, of microplastic pollution on freshwater fish with experiences from here, where we have our headquarters from Lake Constance, and then the connection between macroplastic and microplastic. So uh, two more very interesting presentations. Uh, stay with us and see you in 20 minutes time. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Bettina. We're starting the recording. So help, hello and welcome back to the second part of our today's event on microplastic in lakes. We're looking forward to the presentation from Samuel Koch. Samuel is with the Langenagen Fishery Research Institute or Fishery Research Center to be precise. That is part of the Ministry of Agriculture of the land Baden-Württemberg and the center works in close collaboration. They're in the same facility, so to say, with the Langenagen Institute 
for lake research from the Ministry of Environment of the land Baden-Württemberg. And the presentation will be on microplastic pollution of freshwater fishes, so the effects on the fish fauna. So Samuel, this is your floor, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. So I will start the presentation now. Okay, so today I want to talk about the microplastic pollution of freshwater fish. And here you can see a brief overview of my talk. After a short introduction, I will talk about the microplastic uptake and the residence time of microplastics in fish. And I will show you some results of studies we conducted at the fisheries research station. And uh, Summer, Summer, sorry for the interruption. Yeah. If you put your microphone probably two centimeters further away from your mouth, then we have less disturbing sound. Okay. Is it better now? Uh, maybe it's slightly closer, then I think that we have the ideal position. Now? Yes, thank you. Okay. So, yeah, I want to try and highlight um, potentially important factors affecting the uptake and residence time of microplastics. In the second part, I want to talk about a statewide study we conducted here at the research station. Uh, we looked uh, at the level of burden of microplastic of fish um, and try to find out how high the level burn of burden is really is. And then in the end, I will um, give you a short conclusion. So we already heard that uh, microplastics are a global threat and can be found everywhere in, in oceans as well as in fresh waters. And at, at the same time, we uh, heard that aquatic orga organisms are especially affected. So um, this is especially true for fish because they can ingest a wide range of microplastics in regards to size. And here you can see there's loads of studies showing that both um, fish from oceans and fish from, from fresh waters are affected. So um, early on, people were thinking about what effects can microplastics have on, on fish? And there's a lot of theories about that. And what we can say now for certain is that they are mainly found in the gastrointestinal tract and that they are excreted over time. Um, when you look at the other points, as Hannes Imhoff um, already mentioned, we just don't know right now what's happening in fish. And that is due to the fact that microplastics are a co very complex contaminant and there are a lot of factors playing a role. Um, so yeah, it's very difficult to establish what happens inside the fish. Um, but a really a basic question is how do microplastics really end up in fish? Because um, not much known is about that fact. We know we can find them in fish, but how do they reach them? So you can look at different pathways how uh, microplastics end up in fish. Um, one could be an active uptake. So they just confuse um, microplastic particles with food and uh, therefore ingest them. Then there are passive uptake pathways where they just accidentally ingest them while foraging, while drinking or eating, or they simply just take up microplastics via the food chain. So the last uptake route is quite well um, examined, well studied. There's quite a few of experiments showing that it, it happens. And I think it makes sense that, that microplastics are transferred along the food chain. With the other uptake pathways, um, there is not that much information available. So we did some laboratory experiments looking more at the passive and active uptake of microplastic particles. Um, and we wanted to look at a number of factors that might influence an uptake. So we did um, experiments with four different fish species, you can see in the top. And um, 
they differed in one important aspect. Common carp and crucian carp are chemosensoring foraging uh, fish species. So in other words, they use their taste to decide if something is edible or not. Um, on the other hand, rainbow trout and grayling are visual foragers. That means they decide um, if something is edible more based on color, size, or shape. Um, in the experiments, we um, had six different types of plastics. Um, you can see on the bottom left. Um, these differed on the one hand in, in their color. So there's some brightly colored particles, some more food-like colors, um, the brown PVC uh, particles, or there's quite inconspicuous particles. So you can't really see them well in the water. And we also use different concentrations, three different concentrations to see if that has an effect. Um, then we also looked at um, how feeding affects the uptake. So there were experiments with and without simultaneous feeding. And then we just de determined uh, the microplastic concentration in the gastrointestinal tract of the fish. So here you can see some um, linear models we calculated, which quite nicely summarize which factors have an effect on the uptake. Um, if you look here, um, you can clearly see that um, visual foragers ingested microplastics much more often compared to chemosensory foragers. So um, this is an indication that indeed um, chemosensory fish can detect non-edible particles, which makes sense because they um, search for food quite often on the ground and have need a way to distinguish edible and non-edible food. Um, if you look at, um, when you look at it, when they were fed or non, not fed during the content, contamination, you can see uh, quite some differences. Um, if you look at the prevalence, which is like the, the how many fish had microplastics in their gastrointestinal tract, you see that there's significantly more uh, fish affected when there was feeding. So this is maybe an indication that there is indeed a passive uptake. So while they're feeding, they accidentally just take up microplastic particles. When you look at the abundance, which is the number of particles found in, in the um, gastrointestinal tract, uh, you can see it's quite the opposite. So there were more particles when there was no food available. And this may be an indication that there is indeed active ingestion as well. So when we look at um, the first column where we see visible for forages eight particles more often, then it could be that they just um, took up particles when they were not when there was no food available. Um, then when you look at the particle concentration in the water, you can see also a, a statistic effect, um, which makes sense. When there are more particles in the water available, it's more likely that, that they ingest uh, particles, either active or passive. Um, and then if you look at the um, color of the particles, you can see a strong preferences for food-like particles. So again, there's evidence that there is up active uptake of particles. Um, so it seems like that these visual foragers um, prefer particles that look like their food. So in summary, um, you can see that visually oriented fish ingest microplastics more frequently. Um, <clears throat> but also that accidental ingestion happens both in chemosensory fish as well as in visual foragers. Um, there is some active ingestion of microplastics when the food is not present. And as, as I just so showed you, food-like particles were ingested more frequently. So now we now know a bit more about how particles end up in fish. Now the question is, how long do they stay? Um, 
as I mentioned in the beginning, it's quite clear that um, particles are ingested over time, but how long does that take? What factors might play a role there? So we did another laboratory experiment using common carp and rainbow trout, and they have um, quite a, a difference in their intestinal tract. Um, as common carp don't have a real stomach while rain rainbow trout have a real stomach. Um, we then developed a special feed which contained um, different sizes of microplastic. Uh, you can see it on the bottom left. And we used different concentrations. So we had low concentration, a medium concentration and a high concentration. And we wanted to see if that has an effect on the ingestion of, of particles. Um, on the top right, you can see the size distribution of, of the particles we used. Um, we try to mimic um, the situation in, in the field, and I will come back a bit later in more detail about that. And what we did, we fed them once with a microplastic feed and then sampled them in regular intervals and checked how many microplastics remained in the intestinal tract. Um, here you can see some results. You can see um, on the left is rainbow trout. And um, what is quite clear that irregardless of concentration, um, there was no accumulation. Uh, of plastic particles and 99% of the particles administered were excreted after 72 hours. This was also true for common carp, where 99% of particles were excreted after 64 hours. So it co confirms the knowledge that there's no accumulation and that most particles are excreted over time. Um, where it gets a bit more interesting is when you look at um, the effect of particle size. Um, you can see that really nicely if you look at the T50 value. And the T50 value is the time where 50% of all particles are excreted. When we look now at rainbow trout with a true stomach, you can see with the smallest particles here on the left, the time until 50% of all particles were excreted was around eight hours. And that corresponds quite well with the T50 values of food particles. So this is an ind indication that they are just passively excreted um, with the food. Sorry, one back. If you go uh, to the larger particles over a thousand micrometers, you can see the time is much shorter. So it's just around four hours. So this is quite interesting because that's a clear difference between uh, the smallest and the largest particles. And it might be um, have to do that the stomach has some ability to sort particles and decide if larger partic particles are digestible or not. What reason is there behind or what are the reasons we, we don't currently don't know yet and we need to do more, more experiments on that. But it's quite interesting to see that there is such a big difference between um, small and large particles. If you look at common carp, these differences between small particles and large dark particles are not that big. It's less than three hours and it both corresponds well with uh, the T50 value of food particles. So in those fish species, I think uh, there's uh, purely a passive excretion of, of uh, microplastics. Um, so you can see that size can play an important role when you look at the residence time, time of microplastics. And I think um, future research needs to consider that, that um, especially when just one size is used, that it might have a different effect and a different residence time, which could be quite important when you look at the transfer of persistent pollutants or, for example, the translocation into other tissues. So now let's move on to um, look at how 
high is the level of burden in fish in the environment. So we conducted a statewide survey um, looking at the uh, um, microplastic pollution of fish in, in Baden-Württemberg. Um, we sampled fish from 16 sampling sites uh, from 11 rivers. Um, we also looked at six lakes, which included uh, Lake Constance. And we were quite lucky with Lake Constance because in 2014, there was a large survey called Projet Lac, um, where the whole lake was systematically um, fished and we could get some samples there and look at the microplastic concentration in those fish. Normally, we uh, looked at two different fish species with diverse habitat preference. So uh, if possible, we, we choose a more benthic, so more bottom living uh, fish species and a more pelagic, which means more open water uh, fish species. As I mentioned, we did a more detailed investigation in Lake Constance. And in total, we looked at uh, 1,167 fishes from 22 fish species. So on the left, you can see an overview. And um, it remind, might remind you of the picture Hannes if Imhoff showed you earlier. Um, it is quite random. There are no clear patterns. Uh, you can see that shown is the prevalence. So how many of the analyzed fish um, had microplastics in their gastrointestinal tract? Uh, so there was near, no clear pattern, no hotspots. Um, and in total, around 19% of the examined fish were burdened with microplastics. When you look at the int intensity, it was also quite low. We found, found one to four particles, which is not that high. Um, and it was mainly fragments and fibers, which is quite similar to the um, water samples um, examined in the same areas. Um, we also looked at the number of biotic factors, such as habitat preference or um, trophic state of the fish, to see if those factors play any role in the, in the level of burden. But we couldn't find really any patterns. The only thing we saw is that um, piscivores fish, so fish eating fish, were significantly less burdened. And the theory there is that their prey is quite, uh, ha only have a quite low burden and um, piscivores fish eat quite irregularly. So the chances to ingest um, microplastics along the food chain um, is low and then they, there's time that they ingest the particles again. So their, their level of burden is just lower overall. Let's quickly look um, a bit more in detail uh, on the results from Lake Constance. As, as I mentioned, we had those samples from a lake-wide survey. So we had the exact position where these fish were caught. And we try to find out if we can identify some hotspots in the lake. So certain areas where maybe the microplastic um, pollution is higher in fish compared to other areas. Um, this was not the case. Um, you can see it's color coded on the left. The prevalence um, green is no microplastics. And then it, the more red it gets, the higher was the prevalence. You can see some um, red squares, but that's a bit misleading. If you look at the number of sampled fish, it's most of the time just one fish that was sampled. And if that was affected, obviously the prevalence is 100% really high. So we couldn't find any uh, clear hotspots. Um, what we found in some fish were those paint particles, which likely stem from boat coatings. But there again, they were quite randomly dis distributed over the lake. So we couldn't pinpoint a certain source or area they might come from. If you look at the fish species that were burdened, you can see that the white fish, which is um, economically quite important fish species in Lake Constance, was, uh, had the highest burden. 
Um, it's quite interesting because that's one of the few true pelagic um, fish species that means that they primarily forage in the in the open waters and as we've seen before this could maybe lead to that they're more exposed to microplastics or that they actively ingest them but there's no clear clear evidence for that now if you compare these results from lake constance and southwestern germany with other studies you can see that they are fairly similar um, there are quite some differences if you look at the prevalence uh, they, that can vary quite much but if you look at the abundance which is here in the color mean you can see that it's um, fairly in the same range um, the problem is when comparing studies uh, and i think hannes imhoff mentioned that a few times is um, that is really difficult to compare studies because right now there are no harmonized protocols when it comes to um, isolation of particles, sampling or um, identifying of microplastics. So you have to be really careful when you compare studies because you don't really know what each study did and you always should look into the methods. Another problem is um, the detection limit. Um, if you look at, at the results of our study, you can see that it nicely fits a uh, power law increase. And we saw that earlier, again, with Hannes Imhoff's presentation with uh, from water samples, that there's an exponential increase um, with smaller particle size. And this follows a uh, hyperbolic law you can see here nicely in the double logarithmic um, graph here, it follows a almost straight line. Um, but we can could see a drop in that uh, increase um, with particles smaller for the micrometers. And this was an indication for us that in our study, this is the, the detection limit. As we had quite a few um, data points, we could extrapolate uh, those concentrations. And um, we saw that, um, yeah, that we most likely only see the tip of the iceberg, as mentioned before. And the majority of particles, which are smaller, uh, we currently just can't detect. So we really have to be careful when we talk about um, the level of burden that we might just right now not see um, what the real situation is. Samuel, can you summarize, please? Thank you. So, yeah, I just basically, I'm at the end. Uh, I hope I could show you that there's active and passive ingestion of microplastic and visually oriented fish, and um, that there's also passive uptake, uptake in chemosensory fish. I showed you a bit about what factors played a role um, when you look at the the residence time of particles. Um, and in the end, I showed you that the overall level of burden is low in southwestern Germany and Lake Constance, but there are certain limits. And we have to be careful when we talk about um, how high the burden is, because most likely we don't know what really happens right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Samuel, for the presentation. We have enough time to take a few questions, if there are any. I mean, from a human perspective, considering that a majority of human beings are still carnivore, it was quite interesting to see that there is obviously, or it seemed to be no uh, end of food chain accumulation effect, if I understood you correctly, but there is a certain kind of correlation between the complexity of, a, of the gastrointestinal system and the accumulation of very small particles and that might be and this is my question now that might give some indication that there might be some endocrine effect and the more complex organisms are more prone to that i mean it's it's i know it's difficult to say but uh, there might be a certain correlation that gives ev evidence for that or would you see that differently well 
originally that's what we thought. Um, that's why we considered size as a factor when looking at residence time. What was interesting in, in fish or in rainbow trout, where we, we looked at, was that um, larger particles were excreted more quickly because, yeah, we thought we had a similar thought thinking that um, animals with a more complex um, structure, maybe there might be some accumulation. But right now, at least for fish or for those fish species we looked at, it seems like smaller particles are just passively excreted with the food. So it mainly depends on, on um, how long the food needs. So that could take longer with, with animals with a more complex structure. But interestingly, um, those particles, uh, those big particles were excreted actively, so more quickly, and that's quite interesting. And I think um, that would be positive in a way if, if at least fish had a, the possibility to excrete inedible uh, particles more quickly, because then they could cause less harm. Thank you. Okay, um, there's also one question in the chat um, concerning the real stomach and the non-existing stomachs. Um, from a scientific point of view, how can there be a comparison um, between these two? And the second question is um, how we can then um, consider the, the, the time um, the, the thing is in the, the fish. Um. So I don't know if I understood the question correctly, but basically we had two fish species with a different, different type of, of intestinal tract. And we looked uh, in particularly uh, in, in rainbow trout, we looked at the stomach and in, in, in carp, we looked at the, the, um, the whole intestinal tract. And then we compared the residence time of the particles um, with food particles and, and there's a lot of literature available how long it takes until food particles go through um, the intestinal tract and so we could uh, model some the time particles need to go through the through the intestinal tract and the second question could you repeat it please yeah, the, the, the second uh, question was, um, as it's mentioned in the chat, um, is how long the particles stay in the um, in the fish if you are compare if you are comparing um, the 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 trout and and the carp um, with the real and the non-existing fish. I'm not sure I'm understanding the question correctly. Yeah, Sorry. Maybe but... maybe we can we can um, discuss this question later yeah. directly between um, the the question and, and you. Okay. And yeah. but and there's another um, question in the chat. Um, did you find any harmful effect on the fish in your experimental study? Um, for instance, depending on the plastic concentration. Um, there wasn't enough time to show um, results of studies we did about the negative effects. And as um, Hannes Imhoff mentioned, it is quite difficult to, to study that because microplastics are that complex. But we looked into that and tried to mimic realistic co um, concentrations. Um, and what we saw were there were some differences in growth. Um, and we did some quite extensive research. We looked at the whole um, proteome of, of those fish and tried to find out why that is, and we couldn't pinpoint it. Um, so um, yes, there can be effects on fish, but why and what concentration is really difficult to say. And I think that's generally a problem right now. Thank you very much, Samuel. Um, so then we will uh, close that round of questions. We might come back to that later. I would also have a couple of more questions, but maybe there is a time after the next presentation. So then I would like to introduce to you Laura Gessner from the Environmental Action Germany organization. That's an association that is based in Germany. The acronym or abbreviation is DUH. 
and they have quite a reputation of putting the finger on the wound. Uh, you might metaphorically say in Germany. And uh, we will hear from here uh, um, the effects of microplastics as a source or a driver for microplastic pollution. And I think that is also important, uh, oriented towards long-term solutions, also looking at regulatory frameworks uh, and picking up what I said earlier in terms of precaution. And that always reminds me of uh, my experiences with the dentist. I think it's always better to start early uh, to think about the precaution because otherwise it might get painful and expensive. And I think that's very similar with a lot of environmental challenges we do have. So Laura, thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, yes, thanks for the introduction. I'm just quickly trying to share my screen. Oh, I cannot do that while you're sharing yours. Sorry, um, I was- Give me a second. Now you, you, now you should be able to do that. Yes, Sorry. now I think you, you can hear me, you can see my screen. Yes? Yes. Yes. No. Yes, okay, perfect. So, yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction um, and hello to everybody. Um, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having me. As you just said, I'm going to talk about microplastics today. Microplastics as a driver for microplastic pollution or plastic pollution in general, and also the practical and regulatory solutions we see there. And I think, yeah, as Udo just uh, said, that's maybe something that has been um, uh, missing a bit so so far in our event today, talking about solutions also to a problem that we all see. Maybe we don't really know to what exa extent and where exactly, but yeah, we're going to get there. Just about me, my name is Laura Gessner. I'm working at the German Environmental Aid as a circular economy expert, mainly on the topic of packaging and just some words about the German environmental aid. So we are a German-based NGO. We've been working on preserving the planet and its people for over 45 years. And so we work on a lot of topics, environmental and consumer protection, and then at the national level, the European level, uh, many topics from biological diversity to climate protection to circular economy, which is my um, topic. So for today, we just start like with a quick um, outline of the of the problem. I give you some some numbers and everything like that, and then later on we get uh, deeper into the solutions that we see. So. Probably that's something all of you have seen before, but I always find it interesting to look at it again. Global plastics production since 1950. So basically when plastics were starting to be in, invented and getting more potent until in the graph, you see that's 2015 and we already were over 350 million tons. And unfortunately that trend is unbroken in 2019 we passed 460 million tons of uh, global plastic production every year and that isn't just uh, problematic or interesting because uh, there's a lot of plastic in the world but that's also uh, because plastics account for 3.4 of global greenhouse gas emissions so we always have to keep uh, that in mind as well but we have a lot of plastic, what do we do with it? So plastic, we do make a lot of packaging out of it. Packaging accounts for over a third, some say 35, some even say 40% of plastic production, so global plastic production. Here in this uh, graph, that's the bottom line, the little purple bottles you can see there, it's all packaging. We produce a lot of packaging. Then there's the next is construction, it's textiles, utilities, then the mobility, electronics, all those are important as well, but packaging is by far the most important. And that's what's also interesting to consider all this packaging, it's um, single use packaging. So that's packaging that's been bought, the whatever is in there is used, and then the packaging is thrown away. So it really has a short lifespan, produce, use, throw away. And I just want you to keep these, um, these numbers in mind. So today's topic, macro plastics, not micro macro. You get, the, you get the distinction that I'm trying to make. Um, 
microplastics, just the numbers, I brought you some numbers here, that's uh, from Germany, that's from the Fraunhofer Institute, they estimated how much um, plastic pollution we have in Germany, they say they are like at least about half a million tons um, of plastic pollution every year, and about a quarter of that they say is macroplastic that amounts to 1.4 kilogram per capita and so a quarter is macroplastic for Germany just keep in mind that's that that's a number that's going to be different for for every country um, it's not going to be the same everywhere especially in Germany we have a quite I'd say developed uh, waste management infrastructure so that number is probably even on the lower side looking at that globally Looking at it, speaking about that, looking at it globally, according to the OECD, like 22% of global plastic waste is mismanaged. What does that mean? So into the managed part, so the, the good part kind of, it's the plastic that is being um, that's being incinerated. That is in the in the good part, the plastic that is being landfilled. That also isn't the good part. In these 22%, that's actually all the plastic waste that is really, really treated uh, not in a, in, a, in a proper way. That's going to uncontrolled dump sites. So just accumulating somewhere in a dump that is not controlled at all. It's burned in open pit, pits, so no filters, nothing, whatever, or it ends up in the environment. And there are, for example, the OECD say, as they estimate that there are about 109 million tons of plastic waste having accumulated in rivers by today. And that's um, important um, because today where the, the whole fr frame, framework of this um, event is, is lakes, living lakes. So the evidence indicates that the freshwater environments, so rivers and lakes, they both act like a sink but also a source for plastic pollution. It's a, a sink, that's basically also what Hannes Imhoff showed us before, like when the plastic, um, it travels into the sediments of the rivers and lakes, but they are also a source because they do transport a lot of plastic waste into the oceans, which is actually a phenomen phenomenon, I'd say that's more studied uh, than the lake, the pollution of lakes. Well, but um, talking about macroplastics, where do they actually come from? This is probably not going to be a surprise to, to anyone who lives uh, in this world and has ever been outside. The main source of macroplastics in our world is, is littering. Um, it comes, most microplastic is land-based and this land-based littering is made. Is main, uh, this land-based macroplastics is mainly littering. There is some, yes, of course, there's also this agriculture, especially these foils and films that they use for, for mulching or whatever, that also does pollute the environment, but littering is the most important. And so what is littering? Just giving you a quick uh, definition, it's the improper disposal of waste. This can be voluntary, this can be involuntary, like, um, accidentally when there's um, maybe trash in a garbage can that's, that falls over and is blown away, especially the light plastic particles that um, often happens, uh, that is, that is litter, lit, being considered to be littering as well. How much litter is released into the world? Again, that's not something that's the same um, everywhere, as I just said. In Germany, when we have still quite we are on the better part, like on the better managed uh, waste part where we have the better infrastructure and we have better wastewater treatment infrastructure. There's still like about 1.3 to 3.5 kilogram um, of microplastics released into the world by littering. So littering, what is being littered? Well, it's packaging. Again, that's not surprising. Um, looking at the remembering all the numbers from before, what do we make plastic out of its packaging? What is being littered? It's packaging. So um, studies, studies again, I try to find some numbers on, on freshwater environments in rivers, like half of the 10 most commonly found items are packaging and even looking into the deep sea i found that really interesting but below like six thousand meters 
uh, they counted man-made items and 52 of those were macro plastics, so bigger plastics. And again, 92 of those 52% were single use packaging. And well, why is that important? That's, that's also something that, that um, Mr. Imhoff described. This, plastic, this uh, microplastic doesn't just stay and be microplastic. It's a problem in itself. It's not, it's not uh, um, very environmentally friendly to have that macroplastic, but this plastic is also degra degrading into microplastic. For example, for Europe, there is uh, an, an estimate, estimated 3.4 to 5.7 million tons of secondary microplastic just from the fragmentation of plastic waste with 60% of plastic waste being packaging. Now we go one step deeper and then we go to the solutions. <clears throat> what is actually the kind of packaging that we find that we find in the environment? Here the numbers I've brought you off come from a EU study. They looked at beaches, what are the things that we can find there, what is being letters. And there's always it's always the same culprits. Uh, like non-packaging, for example, cigarette filters, like cigarette butts are really important, cotton butts are important, plastic straws, but looking at packaging is plastic bottles. Bottles are one of the most littered items in the world. A close second, plastic bags, and then all the takeaway um, containers and cups and lids and food containers and crisp bags and sweep wrappers and things like that. So getting to a kind of an interim conclusion, uh, macroplastics are an important driver of microplastic pollution. The most macroplastics, they do stem from littering and packaging is the most frequently littered item. So with certain items, as I just mentioned, being the most problematic. What can we do about that? And ca how can the, this amount of littered packaging leading to microplastic or plastic pollution in general be reduced? Well, the practical solutions that we see, let's start with this one that we don't really see, bioplastics. Bioplastics, that's something that is <clears throat> also brought into the discussion a lot by the industry. It's touted to be the solution. And of course, we understand that because the idea is appealing. We no longer need fossil fuels. We just make bio-based -based plastic. And then we also make it biodegradable. And then we can just, it can end up in the environment and we don't need to take care of it. And it just degrades and everything will be fine. But from our experience, that is not what happens because the bioplastics that are used uh, by the industry, they aren't really, uh, they don't really do that. So our first, the first uh, problem that we have with bioplastic is typically they are not more environmentally friendly than uh, normal plastics. It's just when you look at L LCAs, they don't really, they don't really win there. And then also, the when they're bio-based, you make them out of, you need some material to make them out of. And so often this competes with the food production because you need maybe certain crops or corn or something like that to make these plastics. Then often they are non-recyclable so you can't even make it into something new. And then there's this problem of pseudo biodegradability. It says, often says it's biodegradable that bio plastic, but uh, actually it's not, or only in, lab in, in the lab, in laboratory conditions. So these are all, points us where we say bioplastics aren't the solution we need to stop somewhere else and i'll show we show you where we need to start and that is the waste hierarchy so what is the waste hierarchy the waste hierarchy is at the heart of uh, the circular economy and let's uh i i'd like you to focus at the bottom at the point where it says disposal so this is not what we want to do disposal is like landfilling why don't we want to do that because if we landfill everything if we landfill all the packaging the resources are lost there are methane emissions from landfilling and uh, also you have that problem of bloatware possibly mm, then ne the next one it's called other recovery here that means basically in incineration so the packaging would be burned this again it leads to a loss of resources you can't make anything out of out of that ever again and also greenhouse gas emissions then the next uh, part is recycling recycling isn't wrong not at all but 
as far from what we've seen, it's not the solution. It's not the solution to our problem because first you have to collect all the plastic, then it has to be recyclable, which it which is often isn't isn't. You have to sort it, then there has to be a market for the recycled plastic and everything. It's really complicated. So globally, there's like only nine percent of plastic that is actually recycled. And then when it's recycled, it's often not recycled into the same kind of product, but it's um recycled into a lower kind of product and so that's why we'd say all these three lower parts they're not the solution what we really need to do is to focus on the first two which which is prevention of waste and preparing for reuse or reuse of waste or products so um that is just we need to tackle the problem at the source because like I just uh, need you to think back at the start of my um, presentation. You remember all that plastic being made into single use pa packaging. We need to reduce that. We need to reduce the amount of packaging being produced and sold by not producing it and using other solutions wherever possible. We reduce like the plastic pollution from microplastics from the start. And we don't only do that, but we also tackle like other crises at the same time, not only plastic pollution, but also like the resource crisis and the climate crisis. Because remember those um, several percentages that we put into plastics for greenhouse gas emissions, we need to reduce that. So what is prevention and what is reuse? Prevention just means a packaging that is never produced is kind of the best kind of packaging, but sometimes it's really hard to sell things without packaging. Think a beverage, for example. So we need to put that into a package, packaging that we do not only use once, but several times, because that just improves the, improves the LCA a lot. How do we do that? Well, prevention, it's really easy. Look at the look at the examples I, I brought you you all have seen that like why are the why are apples in the supermarket why are they even wrapped you don't have to use that you don't need that there are lots of fruits and vegetables and stuff that you can buy in supermarkets you don't need any packaging or also um, there's oversized packaging you see this x-ray kind of thing um, where it's half empty and then it's smaller bags in a bigger bag that's just unnecessary you can leave that away the same uh, example with a toothpaste you see there the toothpaste is already really nicely and securely wrapped in the in the plastic container why is there another paper one so that's just some some way we can prevent that and then reusable packaging i just brought you here this to to give you some examples to, to so you so you know what, what i may be talking about what is reusable packaging probably most of you 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 know reusable packaging from beverages. I mean, that's something, as I just said, it's really hard to sell a beverage uh, without any packaging. So you should use a refillable one. In Germany, for example, we have 40% uh, of beverages are sold in refillable bottles. That's the biggest share like anywhere in the world. We'd like to be it even higher. And we'd like to be that the standard everywhere. Also, do you remember all the other types of packaging that are problematic that we find a lot? It's beverages. It's also, for example, takeaway containers. So in the bottom left, you see a picture of a that's a reusable uh, takeaway container. And that's also it's done in a really nice way because it's um, consumer friendly. You go you go to your favorite shop. You say, yeah, I'd like to have a re reusable container. You, smell, you pay a small deposit. You, you eat your thing outside, you bring it back, you get your deposit back. And you have these kinds of um, models for a lot of pro products. And we see more and more products like um, uh, get, coming out of the earth, like mushrooms everywhere. And you have that, you have that for milk, you have that for yogurt, you have that for cosmetics, you have that for transport, you have that for e-commerce, you have reusable solutions are there, they are working, they've shown to be working like on a smaller scale, but now we have to bring it into like uh, we have to make it um, bigger. So we get into the regular regulatory solutions um, really quickly. Like how do we make this a reality? We need the favorable conditions for prevention and reuse, <clears throat> and so we need uh, certain policies. The policies we recommend, I'll try to get into them if I have the time for that. Um, but first, what we need are waste reduction 
targets, we need reuse targets and quotas as well. And then um, we also need like economic incentives. We need better labeling and consumer information. And then we also need to work on green public procurement. So just that you've um, heard it, some important things happening on the plastic pollution part, the UN Treaty on Plastic Pollution, now the EU Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive. And of course, also we need to put those into national laws. Um, I think now my time, I'm running out of time. So a waste reduction target and a reuse target, basically, that's really easy. A waste reduction target just means that we get measurability and accountability from governments. Governments need to tell us that they want to reduce waste and they put to, need to put a number on that. And then we can, we can um, follow that and make it true or, true or criticize it when it's going in the wrong direction. It's the same for reuse. This is a really crucial step in this waste hierarchy that I've shown you. And we need to improve the conditions for it. And one condition is to make it, to give it that place there and to, to say, yeah, we have to reach this target to make it more interesting for all the, all the stakeholders at the market. So that this next time, like the supermarket decides what they put into their sortiment, they will also use like refillable bottles, for example. Then the next step, that's something uh, everybody from Germany will know. It's something sometimes it's something surprising for others. Uh, it's DRS. It's a deposit return system. It's kind of something that what I just explained to you, uh, like with a takeaway container. You and we have that in Germany for beverage bottles, and it's really effective at protecting the environment. Since we have that for certain types of beverages in Germany, there has been a return rate of these bottles. They are sold, and then they are brought back, and the people get back their deposit. And we have a return rate for, of 98%. So this improves collection. This makes recycling easier. And also, of course, it makes it easier to switch to refill, refillable bottles, because a refillable bottle, I always have to bring it back so someone can actually refill it. And therefore, I need this infrastructure that you can see. Then financial incentives just make the more environmental friendly solution a bit cheaper um, than the other one. And also, you, we need taxes and fees that internalize um, external, external costs for the, for the producers. Um, also, we need levies. We want levies on single-use packaging. Like, one example we like to give was the Irish plastic bag levy, which reduced the consumption of plastic bags in its first year by like 90%. So these things like these, when we have proper alternatives and a reusable bag is a really easy alternative, uh, things like that uh, show us that we can do that and it's possible. We just have to have the political way uh, will to bring it through. And then finally, we need better labeling. We need a clear labeling. It has to, it has to say single use and reuse so people can choose more environmental friendly and they don't get confused by all the greenwashing that is out there because people want to be green. And the same green public procurement. We just have to make sure that our schools, our universities, our administrations do use like reusable packaging or no packaging, wherever that's possible. And they can do that. They can write that into their, into their requirements. So they are role models. And also it improves market share because actually like German public procurement, that's like 500, and billion, 500 billion euros a year. So that really could give it a bo the boost that it needs. And with that, I think I'm at the end of my presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. If you want to get into contact, um, here is my info. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, for that comprehensive overview on impacts of littering and regulatory frameworks. And I open the round for questions. I just, I have seen some hands going up, but they have disappeared again. There is a question in the chat. So how could this deposit system um, be transferred to other countries where it is not existent yet? 
Um, well, to, to transfer that, basically the, the national governments, they have to they have to introduce that. They have to um, decide that they implement implement this um, this DRS uh, system. And then you have to decide. There are several things that you that you have to decide on, like what is the how how high do you make the deposit in Germany? It's like twenty five uh, cents. So maybe that's not the the amount that you need in in other countries. And then you just have to make it like as attractive enough so people will actually bring the bottles back um, or cans because we also we also we also have that on bottles and cans and that was like quite a quite a fight to get that in into into the German law. Mm, you have to make it high enough uh, but not too high um, then you have to decide on which on which kind of beverages or which kind of materials you want to have the actually have a DRS and then uh, where we would also say make it as inclusive as possible because later on you only you produce uh, if you don't include everything you produce like um, confusion with consumers and um, yeah it's just it's just it, it's just not very really favorable but, but if you want to go into however ask that question if you want to go into detail on that please uh, feel free to contact me thank you there is Marian Hammel who raised her hand Marian, please. Yes, thank you, Laura. I have a question regarding upcoming legislation uh, in Europe, in the European Union. And no, there is now a starting point to not allow any more single use plastic, etc. And do you know um, how will be or what what can you estimate how will be the, the further development of this legislation? Well, I, 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 I'd really like to look into the mind of the European Commission mm. to know what they are actually going, going to do because we don't, uh, we don't know that yet. There have been first uh, signs that they are, for example, that um, what I told you about waste reduction targets, that there's, this is really a, a measure that they are thinking about and they, they are trying to find out how they can move from this uh, from this standpoint where we are now where a lot of the um, packaging waste in europe it's landfilled or it's incinerated mm -hmm. how can they move it up higher they do put a lot of focus on the recycling part but they also it it seems to be it seems it seems to us there that there is a chance that we actually go 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 more um go upper no i don't know how to say so that go to the higher st mm. stages of of the waste hierarchy but mm. we can't we can't we can't we can't really tell now okay thank you thank you yeah it's obvious uh, that some financial incentives have an effect uh, i'm old enough to recall that there was a time before we had the deposit on single-use cans in germany and being a hiker and a biker I have, of course, seen that there is a difference between the number of cans you can find in the environment uh, 30 years ago and now. And uh, companies do have a tendency to privatize the profits and socialize the costs. So I think uh, regulatory frameworks, of course, make sense. Uh, I think we should open the discussion now uh, to um, all speakers again, all four speakers. Thank you very much for your contributions. So we have enough time for questions that are left and there might be some questions in the chat that we have not yet tackled so i will hand over to dimitri again sorry i was muted um no there are no further questions in the chat but um, um advices uh, to find more sources or interesting um, publications or documentations about microplastics so please have a look um to to the chat where you can find um, studies and hints and, and, and links and hyperlinks to some recent um, documentations about microplastic. Um, but if it's okay, I would have a question to more or less all the, um, to all the speakers. Um, 
looking at the differences between rural areas and city areas, we've heard in the presentation of Mr. Wenghaus that there was uh, there are some differences between um, these types um, in the landscapes. And is it also in 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 the general littering? Um, aspect that we can see that there are some hotspots of of littering or sources for 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 macro or microplastics in rural or city areas. So that's an open question, and who is willing and competent to answer? What well, like did I question? Did I get the question right? There's a different. You're asking whether there's a difference between rural or uh, and urban areas regarding like plastic pollution in general or micro microplastic pollution or no no first looking at at the at the plastic at littering um, mm -hmm. microplastic pollutions and then um, at a second glance looking at uh, microplastic pollutions because as we learned it today, uh, the sources um, are more or less the, 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 the plastics um, degrading in a certain um, amount of time. But just looking at the, the focus we have to do uh, to put in our work um, where we can tackle the, the stakeholders or different uh, groups. Mm. Well, I think you can, looking at, at least um, looking globally, you cannot really say like, um, of course, it's rather urban or rather rural areas because that depends on a lot, a lot of factors. Of course, in the urban environment, you have more people, so probably you have more consumption, you have more packaging, you have more, you have more, more littering. That's that's a kind of a kind of a given. But also, what we see in many parts of the world, um, especially in in countries where you don't have a um, really De nicely developed um, waste management system where you don't have really have any waste collection or anything like that. Maybe you, you have that there in the cities, but you don't have it in the rural, rural environment, but you have that all those uh, packaged products being sold there anyhow, and then maybe it ends up there even more in the environment. So I think you cannot, you cannot really General, generalize that. Of course, we know um, we have some reach. We have you have some hotspots for littering, but those are, for example, tourist hotspots where, where you have a lot of tourism. You you have a, you have a, you have a lot of littering. Um, yeah, that's kind of the 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 maybe not really satisfying answer I can give you. But yeah, to, looking at at absolute numbers, the urban pollution will be. Uh, way larger than the rural pollution. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hannes Imhoff, you raised your hand as well. Uh, of course, the speakers can point out questions to other speakers as well, if you like. Please. Uh, well, maybe another, another side of the coin um, concerning packaging. Sure, in urban landscapes, this would be a, a larger portion of, of the waste. We were doing a yeah, straw to uh, the downtown of uh, Bayreuth with the film team, and we just thought that maybe we find some microplastic to show to the film team, and we were astonished how much of plastic waste we were just finding in the corners. On the other side, if you have a look to other plastic pollution, um, rural landscapes can be have much more pollution as there's a lot of um, agricultural land, for example, and there are different sorts of plastic products are used, they are lost, and then we have sadly, in, especially in Bavaria, uh, a thing which is called um, Bürgermeister Deponie. So um, there are several rural landscapes where they dumped in former times a lot of waste and this waste is coming out of the, the landscape right now. So I don't think that we can say the rural is cleaner than the urban or the other way around. I think it's different sort of contamination. Thank you, Bettina. There was another question in the chat. So, um, well, how can we find a solution if you compare, um, if you go and buy some um, pasta noodles in an um, unpacked, uh, unpacked um, 
store that those are two times higher the price is two times higher than in a discounter supermarket and um and they have much more packaging so for two kilos you have two um two packagings around it so how can we find a solution um, between this price gap thank you and that's a little bit referring to what I just said. That's uh, the privatization of profit and the socialization of costs. So I think the solution, as we all know, is the internalization of externalities. Relatively easy set, complicated um, made. So it's um, that you have to internalize all costs, even those in the faraway future, uh, and put them on the product or on the service. Um, that would be my answer to that. We know it's not easy. But that is would be my answer to that. Maybe there are Laura, please. Yeah, if, if I if, if I may, I, I think I can I can add that to that. I mean uh, I mean the the solution would be for not only the small un, unpackaged um, stores having these uh, having having this pasta in a, in an unpackaged way but also like the big chain stores and that's for example something we are we are also working on maybe you can do that kind of do that by what udo just described making the packaging more expensive in and of itself so it's less attractive to to package it i don't know if you if you can actually do that by by taxes making like, because especially looking at a lot of products like pasta, the packaging is really small and really thin. So if you go by, you go by a tax by a kilogram of packaging material, whatever, it would have to be really high to, to make it less attractive to actually package it. But um, for example, in in France, you have a, you have a law, they have to in this, the big supermarkets, I think, since this year, or maybe next next year only, they have to have like an unpackaged good station, like you have in the non packaging, like in their specialized stores, and they, it, when they have like a their selling floor goes over a certain size they have to have that so they have to offer products like pasta rice lentils whatever in in like a section of the store where you can, where you can bring your own reusable um, container or maybe even they have drs with a container so you can you can do that there are so solutions for that of course yeah then you have to um you have to incentivize that and Making it about the part, making it um, less uh, less expensive. Well, that's that's a question of scale, basically, because those little small stores they have to sell it at a higher pl place. But if you have these really big chains, the big discounter chains, I mean, even like Aldi, like the big German uh, discounter, is doing that. I think in the UK they are selling in some stores. They have these pilots and they sell these uh, pasta without any packaging. So it's doable. You just have to give incentives that thank you i would also have uh, two more quick questions uh but uh, ladies first i saw that there was a hand raised um so frau schmitalovich bitte nein das war eigentlich eher zustimmung zustimmung uh, ich uh, sehne diesen Zuständen entgegen, dass deutsche Supermärkte auch sowas einführen. Das wäre wirklich gut. <lacht> Danke für den Kommentar. Dankeschön. Thank you. And my two questions, one is going to Daniel. Probably I missed it, but um, and you might not be able to, or probably not be able to give the, the accurate figures. But can you probably elaborate very quickly on uh, to what extent the different categories or types of vehicle contribute to the problem? Um, obviously, or I can imagine that trucks and buses uh, have a larger part in terms of the percentage uh, of tire abrasion and, and cars much more than two wheelers. It depends on the country yeah, for sure, but just to give um, rough um, percentages of that. And then one question to um, Samuel. Uh, I was a little bit surprised that you have not been looking into the more common and prevalent species uh, at Lake Constance, like the different perch species, uh, but also the other larger predators, such as pike or, or zander. 
Um, was there any specific re reason that you looked uh, into two cop species, but uh, not looking so much into the predators? In whatever order. <laughs> I can start. Thank you. Um, in Lake Constance, we looked at um, basically all species there are or we could catch. So um, if you remember the, the, the slide where you, you could see the bar graphs, there was like a number of, of different fish species. Um, obviously, we couldn't do that for all rivers we looked at because we wanted to do a, a statewide survey. So we couldn't look at each river at all the fish species. So we had to decide on uh, a middle ground. So we used like different habitat preferences. But in Lake Constance, we looked at all the um, fish species and we looked at pike and sander and stuff. And um, yeah, I tried to summarize the results in showing you that these fish eating species were less burdened. Okay, thank you. And I missed that little detail. And Daniel, are you still with us? I know that you are. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I'm with you. I try to give my best to answer. Um, finally, I mean, uh, we have an aberration rate per vehicle and we have a, a, a mileage, um, average, average mileage per, per vehicle. And this finally, finally results in emitted particles and in emitted tons. Uh, per vehicle. So, uh, of course, if we have more transportation and uh, uh, more transportation uh, kilometers, it might end up in higher uh, abrasion uh, volumes. But it's not only about abrasion and about uh, the mileage, it's also about the, the the streets, the road surface for for local situation, and also about driving behavior. So, all in all, for a single car or for a single truck or for a single uh, motorbike, it's not that easy to differentiate it uh, and to 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 give a certain percentage uh, to compare it. Thank you. Uh, the complexity is, is obvious. I, I mean, as you said, there is a, a certain tendency of more road transportation. And I think that, of course, has an impact on uh, the role that trucks might play to that problem. And then that might also be part of the solution uh, to look into uh, how to minimize the abrasion of, of tires of that specific vehicle category. Are there any further questions? Well, maybe one remark to, to, to this point. Uh, every single kilometer which is not driven is probably the best. It doesn't depend on, on a truck or a personal car or motorbike. That is one perspective. And from the point of transportation, also probably simple, simple ideas like uh, not if you order, for example, from an online shop three times a week, you probably could collect your order order and just order once a week or once a month. So you, you, you could re reduce kilometers, in this case, for example, for small trucks with a really little effort. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that's a very relevant comment, I think, in particular considering the audience we have. Uh, it's probably not the most prominent strategy to talk about uh, less consumption and sufficiency, but uh, to pursue a bigger, better, faster, more strategy that is probably more the North American uh, attitude is certainly not the solution for the future. So thank you very much. I think uh, we also have to consider our lifestyles uh, and we have to consider to change the lifestyle in the end. Um, as I said, probably not the most popular argumentation, but very relevant to talk about it. So thank you very much for that. So if there are no further comments, we don't have to necessarily consume the whole time we have allocated. Uh, that was the purpose. So our purpose was to finish uh, punctually or a little bit earlier. Um, thank you very much uh, once again to all the speakers that have prepared the presentations. Thank you for joining us and your efforts. 
Um, to the audience, thank you very much for your time, for your interest in the Blue Lakes project and in the specific fields of research from our experts that we have been able to invite and involve today. Once again, I would like to encourage you to get in touch not only with us, with Global Nature Fund and our allied partners, so to speak, the Lake Constance Foundation and Lake Ambiente in Italy and their specific uh, very experienced uh, partner and institutions they have involved into that project, but also with the institutions and the organizations of our speakers of today. And I uh, would also like to invite you and encourage you to share your experiences and your thoughts. And in the end, uh, I hope that we will meet again, that we join forces in order to find appropriate solutions for the challenges of our time and to leave a planet that is worth living for future generations. That is, uh, I think, one of the most important aspects and a driver for all the organizations that have been present here today. Thank you very much again. Uh, take good care, um, stay in touch, uh, stay tuned, stay healthy. Goodbye.